Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. 400 years ago, a trio of tiny kingdoms were perched on some damp islands off the coast of Europe. Within three short centuries, these islands would become the centre of an empire which ruled a quarter of the globe and on which the sun never set. I'm Samuel Hume, a historian of the British Empire, and my podcast Pax Britannica follows the people and events that built that empire into a global superpower. Learn the history of the British Empire by listening to Pax Britannica everywhere you find your podcasts, or go to pod.link slash pax. Hi everyone, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please support the Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the ancient world. Thanks again for listening. In the end, he'd finally killed his brother, which was the best of limited options. And after putting Asur Don and Paul's most prominent supporters to death, he may have shown clemency to other key figures in a spirit of reconciliation. Or not, we really don't have all the details. Either way, in 820 BC, Shamshi Adad V was unchallenged ruler of the Neo Assyrian Empire. At least his throne name seemed to bode well, Shamshi Adad I having forged the original Assyrian Empire almost exactly a thousand years earlier. So, some pretty big shoes to fill. And on that topic, in the palace courtyard stood two famous obelisks, just in case he needed reminding of the legendary deeds of his two illustrious predecessors. As standard bearer for the status quo, Shamshi Adad likely followed through by leaving the current system unchanged, which had a whole set of pluses and minuses. But if we're being honest, there was one small part of the whole affair that still felt unresolved. In the darkest days of the Civil War, Shamshi Adad had been forced to seek help from a fairly embarrassing source the king of neighboring Babylonia. As I covered in a recent Patreon episode, Shalmaneser helped the same king, Marduk Zakir Shumi I, crush a previous revolt by his younger brother. And by helped, I mean Shalmaneser done all the heavy lifting. Which led, among other things, to the very first historical depiction of two men shaking hands those men being Shalmaneser III and Marduk Zakir Shumi I, in a relief on Shalmaneser's throne base. Since Assyria and Babylonia were BFFs, Shamshi Adad had reached out to the king to back his claim to the throne, which he'd been more than happy to do, with a few conditions. The language of the resulting treaty suggests an unequal alliance, with Marduk Zakir Shumi in the senior role. For example, while invoking numerous Babylonian gods, there's not a single mention of Asur. It's reasonably possible that the treaty was sealed with the marriage of Shamshi Adad to Marduk Zakir Shumi's daughter, the Princess Shamu Ramat whom you all may know better as Semiramis. To be honest, we have virtually no information on Shamu Ramat's origins, but I'm in the camp that suspects she was Babylonian. We do know that around this time, Shamshi Adad married a Near Eastern princess named Shamu Ramat and made her his chief royal wife. Marriage aside, we know that the unequal treaty with Babylon was a source of lingering resentment. But, of course, there wasn't much Shamshi Adad could do while he was fighting a civil war. In 819 BC, 
the year after the Civil War, Marduk Zakir Shumi died and was succeeded by his son, Marduk Balasu Ikbi, who may have been Shamu Ramat's brother and Shamshi Adad's new brother-in-law. Regardless, just a year or two later, Shamshi Adad launched a full-scale attack against Babylonia. In annals inscribed on his stele at Kalhu, the Assyrian king relates marching south along the foothills east of the Tigris, besieging, conquering, and plundering as he went. After sacking the royal city of dur papsukal near Der, he was confronted by the Babylonian army. The ensuing battle was apparently a stalemate, and Shamshi Adad returned to Assyria to plan his next assault. Interestingly, the Babylonian army is described as being composed of Kassites, Chaldeans, Arameans, and Elamites. Though the current dynasty may not have been technically Kassite, that was still convenient shorthand for Babylonian. The Chaldeans had recently been Babylon's rivals. In fact, Shalmaneser had been encouraged to campaign against them. But with increasing Chaldean dominance of the south, Babylonia had little choice but to forge a tentative alliance. At the same time, Chaldean encroachment may explain why Marduk Balasu Ikbid moved his capital north to Gananati along the Diala. The Aramean presence isn't too surprising. Unlike Assyria, Babylonia had never been wholly successful in either expelling or absorbing them. The tribes that remained may have hired themselves out as mercenaries. The Elamite presence is a bit more jarring, but they appeared to have a more collaborative relationship with the southern Chaldeans than they'd had with previous dynasties. Not that the Chaldeans were a dynasty, at least not quite yet. The following year, Shamshi Adad launched a second, more targeted campaign, one that ended with the fall of Gananati and Marduk Balasu Ikbi captured and chained and dragged off north to Assyria, where, if he wasn't impaled or flayed alive, he could at least have a catch-up with his sister. A year or two later, a local official named Baba Aha Adina seized the Babylonian throne. So Shamshi Adad marched south, captured his capital, and shipped him off to Assyria. On this occasion, he continued south into Chaldean territory, where he received the tribute of its kings. In addition to deporting any would-be royals, Shamshi Adad oversaw the extraction of Babylonia's wealth, gods, and tens of thousands of its people. The cities of Babylon, Borsippa, and Kutha were left untouched, and the Assyrian king performed the sacred services in their temples, after which he basically left. Shamshi Adad apparently had no interest in ruling Babylonia annexing it, or even installing a vassal king. He just wanted it humiliated, weak, and ungoverned. And, well, for the rest of his reign, it was basically mission accomplished. When he wasn't eviscerating his southern neighbor, Shamshi Adad spent most of his time reconstructing post-war Assyria. And yes, Babylonian gold and Babylonian labor were probably a major help. He must have also taken steps to secure the imperial frontier. He certainly didn't come out west, though the Assyrian bridgehead at Kar Shalmaneser remained a permanent fixture. But he did launch at least one campaign up north. According to historians Kenan Isik and Bulent Genk, the annals inscribed on Shamshi Adad Stele record that he dispatched the harem chief, Mutaris Asur, on a campaign to Nairi, where he captured 11 fortresses and 200 settlements. So, first off, Shamshi Adad was clearly comfortable with delegating war fighting, just like his father, Shalmaneser. 
The fact that he was neither old nor infirm suggests that King's personally leading campaigns was now a matter of personal preference. So mark that down for what it's worth. Dispatching the harem chief rather than a Tortanu may simply reflect that the king hadn't yet refilled that role. Historian Karen Radner notes that the campaign's details seem to describe territories south of Lake Urmia, formerly held by Assyria's vassal state of Gilzanu, a territory that Urartu may have conquered or flipped during the Assyrian Civil War. Either way, Mutaris Asur's main opponent is recorded as Uspina, an Assyrian take on the latest Urartian king, Ishpuini. As I mentioned a few episodes back, Ishpuini took power on the death of his father, Sarduri I, who may have died fighting the Assyrians. According to historian Ezra Kakmaz Levent, one of Ishpuini's earliest foundations was the Lower Anzaf Fortress, an outpost defending the capital of Tushpa from assaults from the north and east. A local inscription records that, through the protection of the god Haldi, Ishpuini, son of Sarduri, built this fortress to perfection. The strong king, great king, king of the Baini land. Two aspects are probably worth highlighting. First, that he calls himself king of the Baini land, i.e. Urartu, rather than king of Nairi. And second, that the language of the inscription is, for the first time, not Assyrian, but Urartian. Levant relates how, during the reign of Ishpuini, defensive fortresses were built at strategic spots surrounding the capital of Tushpa, such as Kalechik to the north, Zivistan to the south, and Lower Anzaf to the east. In addition to its strategic position, the Anzaf fortress also served as an agricultural production center where surplus could be stored for the needs of the capital city and or the army. Defensive appears to have been the key term. Historian Ali Kifki notes that inscriptions recording only Ishpuini's name are solely confined to the Lake Van Basin, and usually concerned with buildings and the planting of vineyards and orchards. None mention any military activity. Around 820 BC, as the Assyrian civil war was winding down, Ishpuini elevated his son Menua to crown prince and co-regent. After which, the inscriptions begin to change. According to historian Mirjo Salvini, the Karangundu Stella of Ishpuini and Menua records an Urartian military campaign against the cities of Meshta, Kwa, Sharitu, and Nigibi. The conquest of Meshta is stressed in particular, for which war chariots, mounted troops, and infantry were employed, resulting in significant plunder. Salvini associates Meshta with Tepe Hazanlu, to the south of Lake Urmia. He adds that the kings also campaigned north of the Araxes against the far-lying tribes of Lucia, Katarza, and Uitaruhi, and in the modern Azeri territory of Nakchivan. Together, these inscriptions document the early stages of an Urartian expansion that would end with their regional dominance. Sometime around 810 BC, the kings of both Urartu and Assyria died. While Ishpuini's death saw the succession of the young, vigorous, and experienced Menua, the Assyrian scenario was less ideal. Shamshi Adad's son, the crown prince Adad Narari III, was apparently still underage. And if they'd learned anything from the recent civil war, it's that their new supersized empire could only endure with a powerful hand on the tiller. So the question became, how could they manage to hold things together until the new king reached his majority? Q, a fairly remarkable figure 
Adad Narari's mother, Shamu Ramat. Assyrian women taking public roles wasn't entirely uncommon. While the Middle Assyrian Empire had seen a decrease in women's status and rights, the kings of the Neo-Assyrian Empire had apparently tried to restore a more equal footing. But the concept of a female ruler was an entirely different animal. An Assyrian king was Assur's representative on earth, and, until very recently, was required to lead the Assyrian army on regular yearly campaigns. These two roles were exclusively male, or so went the prevailing logic. Which is why, even though he was underage, Adad Narari was elevated to king so he could properly reflect his god. And why, at some point over the next few years, a new Turtanu named Nergal Eliah was given command of the army. But, of course, an Iron Age ruler was also a builder, an administrator, a diplomat, you name it. Roles that relied on talent and experience and where gender played no part. Roles that Shamu Ramat was extremely qualified and very interested in filling. And, with few other options, the Kalhu nobility decided to back her involvement. The outward reflection of this is that Shamu Ramat was allowed to retain her royal status after the death of her husband, the only Assyrian queen to ever do so. There's a lot of debate over whether she served as queen regent or co-regent or whether her role was more formally nebulous. But to me, it's largely academic. For the next four years, Shamu Ramat was de facto ruler of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. As I mentioned earlier, there's a reasonable chance that Shamu Ramat hailed from Babylonia, a territory sorely abused during the reign of Shamshi Adad. Historians Irving Finkel and Julian Reed propose reconstructing a contemporary passage as saying, Adad Narari III, king of Assyria, and Baba Aha Edina, king of Karnduniash, toward each other bowed and drank wine. The welfare of their lands they established. They suggest that Shamu Ramat may have lobbied for the reinstatement of the deposed king Baba Aha Edina to help restabilize Babylonia. According to the eponym chronicles, which give a very brief entry for each regnal year, we know that during Shamu Ramat's regency, three campaigns were launched to the Zagros and one to Tel Halaf or Guzana on the Kabur River. We have no idea who led the army, Adad Narari, his Turtanu Nirgal Elia, or Shamu Ramat herself which I'm not just pulling out of a hat. Because in the next year, 805 BC, we get some pretty interesting details. The source of the details is a very cool stele recovered from the village of Pazarchik in modern Turkey, which I'll definitely post a picture of. The stele's inscription is perfectly preserved and proclaims it to be a boundary stone of Adad Nirari, king of Assyria, son of Shamshi Adad, king of Assyria, and of Shamu Ramat, queen of Shamshi Adad, king of Assyria, mother of Adad Narari, mighty king, king of Assyria, daughter-in-law of Shalmaneser, king of the four corners. If the formulation sounds a bit unusual, it's because Assyrian stelae don't typically focus on the titles and lineage of the king's mother, which means an exception was clearly made in the case of Shamu Ramat. The rest of the stele gives an account of the 805 campaign, for which I'll need to give you a bit of background and point you toward the regional map. Let's start things off with a discussion of Bit Agusi. By 805, the latest Bit Agusi king, Atar Shumki I, ruled from the city of Arpad. And going forward, I'm just going to start referring to Bit Agusi as the kingdom of Arpad. 
I mentioned back in episode C-19 that Atar Shumki's father, Hadram, had been defeated by Shalmaneser in 834 and his city of Muru seized as an Assyrian fortress. We don't have the details, but it's a pretty safe bet that sometime around Shalmaneser's death, Atar Shumki had expelled the Assyrian garrison and reclaimed the city for Arpad after which he'd followed in the footsteps of previous rebels by forging a regional coalition. The king was actually fairly successful. Pretty much all the kingdoms west of Arpad decided to join his alliance, including Quay, Patan, Samal, Gurgum, and some of the kingdoms of Tabal. But the kingdoms along the Middle Euphrates were a bit more trepidatious. The kingdom of Malachia may have joined up, we're not 100% sure. But the kingdom closest to Karshalmaneser, our old friends in Karkemish, evidently had zero interest. Though I should also mention that the 9th century BC is basically a Karkemish Dark Age, where we have so few details that we don't even know who was king. But though they refused to join the alliance, at least they didn't go snitch. That role goes to the king of Kuma, Supaluliuma I. And dude, way to drag a respectable name through the mud. In the inscription, Adad Narari records that Supaluliuma, king of Kuma, caused Adad Narari, king of Assyria, and Shamu Ramat, queen, to cross the Euphrates River. In other words, Supaluliuma gave the king a heads up that Syrian resistance was brewing. But let's not bury the lead. The inscription states that, in response to his call, both Adad Narari and his mother, Queen Shamu Ramat, came to the rescue, which suggests that Shamu Ramat took an active role in the campaign. And if you grant that, it opens the door as to which other campaigns she may have co-led, or possibly led on her own. Memories of Shamu Ramat's rule echoed down to the classical era in the legend of the warrior queen Semiramis. According to the legend, Semiramis was a semi-divine figure who supposedly founded Babylon, Nineveh, and the whole Assyrian Empire. As historian Stephanie Dolly notes, the story likely also draws some inspiration from later Assyrian royal figures, including Atalia, the wife of Sargon II, and Nakaya, the wife of Sennacherib. Deborah Guerra adds that the story of Semiramis likely originated as a Mesopotamian legend, only later finding its way into Persian and Greco-Roman literature. In any event, the legend began with the real-life Queen Shamu Ramat. The armies clashed near Pakar Hubunu, on the west bank of the upper Euphrates. Adan Narari relates that I smashed Atar Shumki of the city Arpad together with eight kings who were with him at the city Pakar Hubunu, their boundary and land. I deprived them of their camp. In order to save their lives, they went up to the mountains. Which, again, may be Assyrianese, for I was unable to capture or kill any rebel kings or collect any tribute or plunder. In fact, Adad Narari's main stated accomplishment was securing the borders of Kuma. And he notes that in that year, they put up this boundary stone between Supaluliuma king of Kuma, and Halparuntaya, son of Larama, king of Gurgum. Adad Narari seals the inscription in the name of Asur, my god, and the moon god Sin, who dwells in Haran, which may be why the stele is surmounted by a large crescent moon. Again, it's very cool looking. Going off the eponym chronicles, three more Syrian campaigns followed though we don't have any stelae to give us the details. Actually, that's not quite true. We have three more stelae of Adad-Narari, 
the Kala stele, the Sabah stele, and the Tel El Rima stele. The problem is, it's difficult to unpack which years particular events occurred, since the entries are often jumbled, compressed, or contain contradictory information. All three stelae appear to cover events from a few years down the line, so we'll dig in deeper when we get there. But one major event they entirely miss is the death of King Hazael of Damascus. For the past 40 years, since the death of Hadad Azer back in 842, Hazael had dominated the Iron Age kingdoms of southern Syria and Canaan. As far as we know, Adad Narari never conquered or even warred against Aram Damascus while it was under Hazael's rule. It wasn't until after Hazael's death, around 802, that the kingdom was finally humbled. And we'll get to that story in a bit. Which places Hazael, along with his predecessor Hadad Azer, among the very short list of Syrian kings to weather the Assyrian storm. At about the same time as Hazael's death, the Neo Hittite regime in nearby Hamath was supplanted by one of Aramean origin, which may not be that surprising. Based on inscriptions and other factors, historian E. Lipinski suggests that the Neo-Hittite element of Hamath was rather restricted, and the old stock of North Semitic or Amorite peoples formed the bulk of the local population. It also appears that, in contrast to his predecessors, the new Hamathite king, Zakur, was favorably disposed toward Assyria. And, consequently, he quickly found himself under attack by both Atar Shumki's Syrian alliance and the new king of Aram Damascus, Hazael's son and successor, Bar-Hadad II. In a text inscribed on a statue of his god, Zakur describes the conflict. Bar-Hadad, the son of Hazael, king of Aram, united seven kings against me. Bar-Hadad and his army, Bargust and his army, the king of Quay and his army, the king of Patan and his army, the king of Gurgum and his army, the king of Samal and his army, the king of Malachia and his army. All these kings laid siege to Hatarika. They made a wall higher than the wall of Hatarika. They made a moat deeper than its moat. But I lifted up my hand to Baal Shemin, and Baal Shemin heard me. Baal Shemin spoke to me through seers and diviners. Baal Shemin said to me, Do not fear, for I made you king, and I shall stand by you and deliver you from all these kings who set up a siege against you. Baal Shemin said to me, I shall destroy all these kings. Since he managed to inscribe all this on a statue, we know that Zakur survived the siege. But it may not only have been through divine intervention. Though there's no specific record of it, it seems reasonably likely that Zakur was saved by the timely intervention of Assyria. Lipinski notes that Adad Narari ordered his latest Turtanu, Shamshi Ilu, to mediate the dispute between Zakur and Atar Shumki of Arpad, which suggests the Assyrians crossed the Euphrates to relieve the siege of their vassal. In the end, the Turtanu erected a border marker, conventionally known as the Antakya Stele, setting the official boundary between Hamath and Arpad. So, this is the nature of the Syrian landscape at the dawn of the 8th century BC, a renewed era of Assyrian attacks and of local Syrian defiance. A score of Syro-Hittite kingdoms remained. Carchemish, Kuma, Malachia, Gurgum, Patan, Quay, and Halaku, Samal and Arpad, Hamath and Aram Damascus as well as the small Neo-Hittite kingdoms of Tabal in central Anatolia. Even at this stage, there was no real sense of Assyrian inevitability. 
In fact, the reign of Adad Narari III would prove a relative high point before another imperial decline. But regardless of how things looked at the moment, the 8th century BC would prove decisive. Because by the time it ended, not a single Neo-Hittite or Aramean kingdom would remain in northern Syria. The Ancient World Podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Along with My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, The Explorers Podcast, and other great shows.